long to leave. Hello. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Jess. I'm the Adult Services Director here at Durham Public Library. And we are so thrilled that you could join us this evening. There is coffee and tea and water in the back if you're so inclined, so please help yourself. And if you're interested in our upcoming programs, please grab a calendar on your way out in the lobby. We are so pleased and honored to have Jim Dean, the UNH president, with us this evening. He became the 20th president of UNH in June of 2018, I believe. And he is here to tell us about his new book. I believe it's his third publication. And it was just published with Deborah Clark in September of this year. And it's entitled The Insider's Guide to Working with <coughs> Universities, Practical Insights for Board Members, Business People, Entrepreneurs, Philanthropists, Alumni, Parents, and Administrators. Please welcome Jim Dean. Thanks so much for that introduction. <coughs> Super. Well, thanks very much uh, for coming out tonight. And uh, this is the book, by the way. I did bring one copy. And many of you I know are you're, you're my friends, and so I know you've read it already. But if you haven't, this is what it looks like. And so I'm only going to talk for a few minutes. I think it would be more fun just to do Q&A about the book. But I, I want to talk a little bit about why we wrote it, what the main arguments in the book are, and maybe a little bit about what the reactions have been so far. So why did we write it? The, the logic of the book and the logic of why we wrote it is the following. So universities have lots of opportunities, challenges, problems, whatever word you want to use. And you know, like, like any big social institution, we have pressures on all sides to try and address the problems we have, to try and get better, uh, to try and better meet the needs of our, of our constituencies. And many of the problems that we have are very similar to the kinds of problems that businesses have. So we just use different languages to talk about it. So we make tuition decisions, businesses make pricing decisions. You know, we operate dining halls and residence halls, businesses operate hotels and restaurants. Um, we're concerned about our reputation, businesses are concerned about their brand. I could go on, but you get the, you get the idea. And so it seems likely that business people should be able to help us to move forward as universities. And the good news is that many, many people, including many business people, in fact, have stepped forward. The biggest category of people who have stepped forward are board members. And so if you look at universities across the country, we have boards at the university system level, such as we have here in New Hampshire. We have university level boards. There are college or school level boards, for example, a law school or a business school. And then there's, um, program and center level boards. And if you start to roll all of those up, conservatively, there's probably 300,000 people serving on boards in the United States, probably actually bigger than that, many of whom come from business backgrounds, uh, many of whom on you know, university boards are alumni, um, none of whom are getting paid, and all of whom want to help universities get better. But when we started writing the book and we went out and talked to the people who were volunteering on these boards, especially people from business backgrounds, we found that they had a pretty wide variety of experiences and that many of them were frustrated by the experiences that they'd had working with universities. And in fact, many decided to withdraw from the board they were on or actually from the university itself because they were discouraged at the pace at which things happened at universities uh, the university's tolerance for, let's just say, dissenting voices within the university. Uh, they were worried about things like tenure, um, shared governance. Why do you let the faculty tell you what to do? Um, many things that they were just sort of concerned about. And so if you've, I know many of you have read the book already. So the first chapter gives a number of case studies of people who wanted to be helpful and, and weren't or couldn't. So we thought about it some more. And we thought, well, why not? Why, why are they not able to be helpful? Why are they not having better experiences? And I think that one of the, so there's two main reasons, and I'll go back through the, this again at some uh, additional level of detail. But the one reason is that they simply don't know enough to be helpful. And a lot of business people make the assumption that universities are just like any other business, and we're really not. Uh, 
I, I tell my business friends that moving from a business into a university is like going into another industry in another country. That's how different it is. And you really have to be ready for that. And so what that means is that there's a burden on universities to prepare the people who are trying to help us to do education, which we should be good at. Um, and yet we don't do much. And so really the average board member comes in and if you get a day, you're actually pretty lucky. Well, I'm just gonna say a day is really not enough to understand how universities work. It's not even close. And we know a lot now about onboarding uh, of people into new jobs and board roles and so on. But the people who are in the best position to help universities, we simply don't do enough to help them. And there's no way people aren't born knowing what tenure is or what shared governance is. And you're not gonna find out by working in a business because they don't have either one of those things. So one of the things that we wanted to accomplish with the book was that we could give the book or universities could give the book to their new board members and say, read this first, and then we'll see what questions you have about how universities work. So I've, so far I've been talking about board members, which is the main audience, but it's really interesting to learn that many college presidents and many deans and many vice presidents have no university experience. And I think I'm remembering the statistic right from the book that 42% of college presidents have never been a faculty member. So that's, that's a lot to learn. And there's actually a guy recently, he's, act, he's the dean of the Darden Business School at University of Virginia, who's written a book kind of in praise of non-traditional deans and presidents, arguing that there should be more. So I think they should sell our books together. Because if there's gonna be more, they clearly have to understand the universities better th than they do now. Um, and again, that's not the fault of business people. And to be fair, I I'll do an aside and say, one of the interesting things about writing this book is that I knew there were gonna be two big groups of readers. Um, one, the business people who are really the target audience for the book, and the other, the academics who were gonna read the book in hope, and my hope would be that they would give it to the business people. And so I'm trying to balance those two constituencies, and I'll maybe come back to that uh, again. But I, I think it's clear that as universities, we need to do a better job of educating the people who are trying to help us. And so that's one big thrust of the book. Um, the other thrust, which I really only get to with my co-author, Deborah Clark, who is, by the way, a, a really lifelong family friend and colleague, and we had a lot of fun working on this together. Um, for any of you who are devotees of Saturday Night Live and have been for a long time, every time Debbie would read a draft chapter, she would simply say, more cowbell. <laughs> so we tried to put some cowbell in there wherever we could. Um, so the one argument is about what people need to know. The second argument is really an argument for better collaboration between board members and uh, university leaders. And the argument, there's, there's two kinds of arguments. One is more theoretical, and I'll skip that one. But the one that that's, uh, is more straightforward is really an argument from diversity. So aside from all of the political issues about diversity, fundamentally what diversity is about is that if you have a set of people who all think the same, you don't really have much diversity. But if you have a group of people who bring different perspectives, then you've got the opportunity to solve problems in more creative ways. And I'm sure you've all seen that in, in your careers. And so here we are in universities with a set of academics who have had one sort of experiences and one sort of training. And you've got a set of business people that have had very different experiences and very different training. And if you could actually get them to collaborate, you would probably come up with some pretty innovative solutions to the kind of problems that, business, that universities face. But in my experience, uh, it doesn't always work that well. And so part of it is because they don't know enough about one another's worlds. And so I've already said business people don't know enough about universities. If you put the average faculty member on the board of a public company, it wouldn't be pretty. So they don't know enough about the other world as well. And so you, what you want is some mutual understanding and some mutual respect and a desire to collaborate. And I really hope that the book has the impact of trying to give people the information they need and the stimulus for collaboration that will allow them to work together and to solve the very real problems that we're dealing with every day in university settings and, and in board settings. So the, the book in the first instance was for board members. After that, it was for people who became deans or um, presidents. 
Um, but then, you know, the, we worked with the publisher on this, and they have a very long list. Board members, business people, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, alumni, parents, and administrators. So all of those people need to read the book, apparently. Um, but we were mostly thinking of board members and administrators who come from business. So what are the kinds of things that we thought that it would be helpful for people to know about universities? And here's where it's funny, where you really see the various thought worlds. Because a lot of the people who did the uh, reading of individual chapters for me, and we thank them all in the book, there's 50 of them at least, um, the, the average reaction among peop business people was, hmm, I didn't know that. That's interesting. I'm glad that's in the book. Uh, the average response among academics was, hmm, you need more nuance, more detail, right? Yes, that's true about tenure in some places, but not in other places. And, and that was a constant kind of thing. When, when we first started to write the book, we went online and, and said, oh, how many words should be in a book like this? Literally, the first day. So the answer is, if you Google how many words should be in a nonfiction book, they tell you 50,000 to 60,000. I thought, OK, these are busy people. 50 sounds good. So we'll shoot for 50. And we thought, well, 10 chapters sounds about right, plus that makes the math easy. 10 chapters, 5,000 words each, we can get there. And so we literally had a schedule. Um, in my case, I had nine months to write the book between when I stepped down as provost at, at UNC and when I started this job. When we started the book, I didn't know I was going to be here, but I kind of hoped I'd be someplace. So it turned out to be here. It worked out really well. Um, and so we were on a words per day regimen of writing. And you know, I thought that that was sort of almost like an inside joke, like how would a business professor write a book like that? But then I've actually read that real writers do the same thing, right? And the words per day thing is, is a pretty good way to get a book written. Um, so that's why the book is about the, the length that it is. So we talk in the first, the first chapter lays out the argument. It's actually the introduction of why the book was created and so on and provides some of the case studies of people who somewhat tragically became frustrated with their alma maters and withdrew from connection with them. Um, the second chapter, sorry, the first chapter, chapter one, after the introduction, it was actually the most fun chapter to write. And my PhD is in organizational behavior, so my sort of first love academically is organizations and how they work or don't work and how they're different and how they're similar. And so that was just really a lot of fun. I had uh, a flip chart in the office that I was using um, with sort of similarities and differences between businesses and universities. And every time my co-author and I would meet, we would sort of argue it out and hash it out. And so that's the chapter that, th that resulted from those conversations. So there's a number of ways in which businesses and universities are sort of similar. You know, pressure to use scarce resources, for example, having to answer to a number of different constituencies would be another example. Uh, the war for talent, the challenge of getting the best people in and, and keeping them in. But there's, there's also many differences. And almost all of the differences stem from the fact that businesses, by definition, have a profit motive. That's the thing that makes a business a business. So if you think for a second, what is something called that's not a business? Not for profit, right? Mm -hmm. And universities are in that space. And so at, at the first, at first blush, you think, well, OK, that's a difference, but it's not that big a difference. The argument of the book is it's a gigantic difference because business decisions can all be brought down to what's the impact on profit. And so if you take one step back, OK, what's the impact on revenue or what's the impact on cost? And you take another step back and you get the market share and so on. But, but all of those decisions are driven to that. So many of you I know have worked in and around universities. What's the equivalent of profit in a university, there really isn't one. I mean, if, in the book we say that the closest you come to it is reputation or prestige. Or you could say mission. And the, the quality with which you implement your mission leads to prestige and recognition and so on. But that's a lot messier than a calculation of profit. And so that then leads to, well, let me make one other difference. So in business, businesses have many constituencies. So, when you, so if you read the local newspaper like we do, 
uh, the Portsmouth newspaper and you see some developer wants to build an apartment building in downtown Portsmouth, then you realize how many constituencies that a business has. Um, and universities are like that, but in spades. We have so many more constituencies, faculty, students, parents, the government, if it's a public university, the state, accreditors, I could go on, um, professional organizations. And in business, everything reduces to profit and basically the constituency of the shareholders, whether they be public or private. In universities, we have multiple goals and all constituencies are important and no one constituency dominates all of them. So when you, when you have a decision in business, how is this going to drive profit and influence the shareholders? If you have a university, how is this going to drive our top 10 goals and influence the top 10 constituencies that we have? So I wonder why decisions in universities take longer. That's why. So one of the great resources that we found in writing the book was a piece by Jim Collins, who if you're a business person, you almost certainly have heard of. He wrote the book, famous book, Good to Great, one of the best-selling business books of all time. He then wrote an addendum to the book called Good to Great for the Nonprofit Sector. And the number one thesis of his entire work in that thing is not-for-profits are not like businesses, and it's a mistake to try and make them like businesses. And we quoted the heck out of that, because that was really making the argument we wanted to make. So that chapter is really about similarities and differences, and that goes on to differences in the sense of urgency between the two. Uh, we argue that businesses go out of business every day, and universities almost never go out of business. Although I will say, in the year since the book was finished, universities are going out of business more often than they used to. But I still say it's this, and businesses are like this, going out of business all the time. But I will acknowledge that's a bit of a surprising sea change in universities. So then the next few chapters of the book are all about what are the things that business people should know. So we talk about the, uh, the external control of universities, state regulations, federal regulations, federal agencies, uh, Supreme Court decisions or court decisions having to do with uh, affirmative action or before that about admissions fairness. Um, the whole Title IX thing that you've probably been reading about, how that changed universities. Uh, and then we talk about accreditation as well and the nature of accreditation and all of the things that influence universities from the outside. Then we talk about universities from the inside. We talk about the nature of shared governance and what that means. Uh, we talk about what it is to be a president or in some universities a chancellor, how the chancellor or president works with his or her leadership team, then what it's like at the dean level and what a dean tries to do, how the dean interacts with department heads and what they try to do, and then working with the faculty, basically making the argument that the sort of clear chain of command that you have in businesses doesn't really operate in universities, even if it looks like it does. Because, you know, there's the hierarchy, I get it. So, so do the department heads tell the faculty what to teach? No. No, that, that doesn't happen. Um, no. I mean, does the provost tell the deans who to hire? No. Does even the department head tell the faculty who to hire? No. So a lot of expectations you would have, and I know many of you in the room are academics, so you're laughing at the questions. But trust me, to a business person, this is not obvious that, that these are the differences. So we talk about the nature of authority. Um, one, of the question, one of the chapters, and in fact, it was one of my favorite um, titles for a chapter, is simply, who are the faculty? Which you can read with a lot of different accents, like, who are the faculty <laughs> like that? So you can do it a lot of different ways. But business people have no idea how you get to be a faculty member. None. And so you tell them, well, you get a PhD. And so do you know how a PhD program works, right? Nope, no idea. So the idea that someone who's, let's say someone who's tenured, a tenured faculty member, spent, no matter what age, whatever range I give you, you're going to say it's not wide enough. But I'm going to say they've spent four to nine years in a PhD program. The average is more like six or seven. If you're in science, you're probably going to do one or two postdocs, one year, two years. Then you get hired, you hope, as an, associate or as an assistant professor, and then spend about another six years um, before you get to the tenure decision. And then you get tenure. So the average person might be 35 or 40 years old by the time they get to that point. And I had one business person I interviewed. I interviewed about 50 people for the book, at both academics and business people. And one business person said, well, people go into academics because they don't like risk. 
So I took them through this. Okay, so five or six years in a PhD program, another couple of years as a postdoc, six years as an assistant professor to find out whether you're really going to be hired for good. That doesn't sound like low risk to me. So this is the kind of translation thing that we were trying to do in the book. Uh, we also talk about research and we give sort of three case studies of the nature of research, research in physical sciences, um, research in social sciences, and then um, research which is usually called scholarship in the humanities and how different those are, how you publish them, books versus journals, um, whether they get funded, yes to science, maybe in social science and probably not in the humanities. It's a little bit better than that, but not quite. Um, how is research evaluated? Um, lots of ways research can be evaluated and so on. So I'm just going to look and see if there's any major pieces I left out, and then I think we're going to go to Q&A very shortly. Oh, we do talk about differences between institutions. So we use public versus private, huge, huge differences there. And then we talk about the Carnegie classifications, uh, research universities, master's level universities, and um, baccalaureate colleges and how different they are. Oh, then one chapter is on uh, where does the money come from and where does it go? And that's of course very different in public versus private universities in particular, how much there is. Um, but the discrepancies are there are really amazing. The, some of the information that's in the third chapter about the, the largest endowments in the country and where they are, I mean, they're all in private universities. And, and if you start doing it on a endowment per student, the numbers are staggering uh, of how large these endowments really are. So it's no wonder there's a little bit of a backlash. And uh, now, of course, the endowments of the largest universities, uh, the endowment, the largest endowments of universities are actually taxed now. Um, good news for the University of New Hampshire, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> That's also the bad news. So anyway, then the book culminates with a case study about something that took place at UNC when, uh, when I was there where we wanted to privatize the bookstore effectively and the arguments that went back and forth about privatization. And we ultimately ended up um, basically hiring Barnes & Noble to run the bookstore for us. And it, it, it's a funny kind of a bittersweet ending to the book because from a business standpoint, the decision was a complete success. Uh, the bookstore at UNC generates money that goes to scholarships for students and they tripled or quadrupled or something the, the millions of dollars that were going to scholarships for students. You know, pretty successful. There was also a clause in the agreement that they had to keep on for a number of years the employees because the faculty were really worried that Barnes & Noble was going to just get rid of all the employees, many of whom had been there for a long time. So we wrote into the contract that they couldn't do that. So from a business standpoint, it was a very successful decision. But I interviewed for the case study the two faculty members who were the faculty senate representatives in the process. And they acknowledged that their own minds had been changed pretty substantially by the experience of working through this. And they eventually voted for Barnes & Noble as being the, uh, the right vendor or the right partner for the bookstore. But at, at the end, after the last presentation had been made, a guy who's actually a friend of mine, Brad Ives, was the, uh, the chair of the committee. And after the last meeting, Brad goes like, yeah, we got about five minutes left, but I think the decision here is pretty obvious. So we're good with Barnes & Noble, right? So, so Brad hadn't been to too many faculty meetings. <laughs> and, and so my, my two friends, um, Beverly Taylor and Lloyd Kramer, who were the faculty members on that committee, go, no, that's not how it works. We need to talk about it. So they talked about it for about an hour. And then they said, yeah, Barnes & Noble seems like the <laughs> right way to go. And you know, anybody who's been in these meetings knows exactly what I'm talking about. And we even say in there that for many faculty meetings, the decision is kind of like a byproduct. It's the talking that's really important. And, and Brad, bless his heart, so that was a North Carolina thing, bless his heart, sorry. But he just didn't sort of understand that yet. But he, he did a terrific job. So that was one of the kind of funny ironies about it. But then the other irony was, so I, I interviewed um, Beverly and Lloyd, and Jan may remember I was on the phone with them from home one day. And they said, yeah, you know, I know that the bookstore is a lot bigger, and I know that it's a lot better. They have a lot more titles. They're much more profitable. They're contributing much more money to student scholarships. But somehow I miss the small, ratty, inconvenient, 
place that we had for many years. And I thought, that's how the book's going to end. Because that's it, right? I mean, what does it take to have an organization be successful? Well, it depends on who's making the judgment. And faculty, faculty members making the judgment, they grudgingly admitted it was the right decision, but they just weren't that happy about it. They said it sort of lost the feel. And, you know, everybody gets to evaluate things from their own perspective. But it did sort of bring home the cultural gap between the business people who were sort of leading this process and the faculty members who were sort of part of it. And it was really kind of a privilege to have a, a ringside seat to watch that. I was going to put more case studies in there, but I had 50,000 words, so we had to stop. <laughs> OK, I talked longer than I intended to. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to either hear any reactions you have to the book, which I'm quite happy to hear, whether they're positive or, gee, you messed this thing up or something. Or if, if you have any questions about anything in the book, I'm happy to hear those as well. And I'll free myself from standing behind the desk to do that. Yes, me. So I'm answering this question with full recognition that one of our Board of Trustees members is sitting about six feet from me. <laughs> so actually, I'd be interested in you. So many of you probably know Margie Smith, the representative from this area, who is also on the Board of Trustees. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a chance to answer that as well. I, I think the beginning of it is to make sure that we're doing a good job of onboarding. I think the system is trying to do a bit better. Uh, the, People on the board have the opportunity to go visit each of the universities in the system. Um, there's also a lot of background reading. And so Todd Leach, who's a, our system chancellor, sends out a lot of uh, articles from the Chronicle of Higher Ed and Inside Higher Ed for people to read. And now I'm noticing, and I think you've done it, that people who read on the board who read things will send it to other members of the board. So it's not an impossible task. It, it's just a lot of work. And, and that's what, sort of what it comes down to. People have to be willing to do the work. And, and they also have to be willing to acknowledge that their view of the world may not have everything in it that they need in order to really help run a university. And that's a little bit of a heavier lift for some people. I will say my experience with the Board of Trustees here has been great. People are really committed. They're really trying to learn. Um, and so we haven't had that much of a problem with that. I, I still think we need to do a lot more onboarding, a lot more orientation. Do you want to comment, Margie? I think people are here to listen to you, not to me. No matter what I say, she disagrees with me. See, that? that's what it's like. Even when I try to give her the microphone, she disagrees with me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, other thoughts or comments that you'd like to make? Uh, while you're thinking about that, one thing I'll say is I, I did say that I wasn't going to have books with me. But Frank is here from the UNH bookstore. Raise your hand, Frank. So if you are moved by the spirit to buy a book, he's the man. So I'm happy to give that business to the UNH bookstore. So other reactions or, or thoughts about the premise of the book, or if you've read it, uh, any thoughts about what was in there? Yes? Uh, your anecdote at the end about uh, the faculty liking the older bookstore prompted me to think about all the list, the list of constituents you talked about. Mm -hmm. that, You mean tonight when I mention them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's in the book, trust me. <laughs> can you comment on how the students play into decision making on campus and where they are in the pecking order of importance? Okay, that's a fair question. They're the ones paying the bill. To some degree. To some degree they are. Uh, depending on the nature of the university, in some universities, they pay uh, more than the more than 50% of the bills, and some they pay far less than that. Um, we at UNH are a pretty tuition-dependent university, so so yes. Well, it depends on the decision. If it's a decision that influences students, and not all do necessarily or directly, then then they are first in the pecking order. Um, we try to always understand what their needs are, but as you know, I mean, clearly you spent some time around universities. Students are not monolithic. And so it's really hard to say what's the best thing for students, period. So do we mean graduate students or undergraduate students? Do we mean resident students or non-resident students? And do we mean the students who are on Pell Grants because they're poor? Or do we mean the students whose parents have enough money that they're driving a fancy car around campus? 
And so, yeah, we, we certainly think about the students, and, and they are the primary constituency of the university. But even when you acknowledge that, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds at first blush. That's a good question. Thank you for that. And you know, one thing I'll say is students aren't in the book a lot. And the reason they're not in the, in the book a lot is that they're really more about the organization of the university. Um, the one piece, and I didn't talk about this, but the one place where students show up is, other than talking about the number of them and so on, is there's a subsection which talks about changes in education over the last few years. And so we talk about the conventional model of lecturing and discussion sections and so on, which is still in place in many areas, but is really getting replaced much faster than the general public understands by things like the flipped classroom where people watch the lecture online and then do Q&A in the classroom, by things like uh, service learning where they go out into the community and work with the community group, by things like internships, by study abroad, uh, undergraduate research. So all of these things are really changing the nature of education, I think, much faster than people realize. Um, you know, you're, it's always dangerous to make these kind of predictions. You like the Yogi Berra line, right? It's dangerous to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> right? One of my favorites. Um, but I think, you know, five or ten years from now, I think that the lecture format is going to be kind of the minority of teaching. I think it's on the way now. In certain disciplines, it's already there. So that change is happening, and that's very much a student-centered um, change because research has now found that the new term for this is high structure or high impact learning experiences um, can be demonstrated through careful research to be better for learning than the conventional method. I mean, let's face it, some people are great lecturers and others aren't. Um, and even if you're a great lecturer and students really like you, that's not the same as saying you've learned the material. The other thing, and this is sort of more interesting and more complex to deal with, is that the some of the people who did this research were at UNC, so I know them pretty well. They found in really, really carefully controlled experiments that not only was the high structure teaching more effective for student learning, but they found that there was a statistical interaction such that first generation college students and minority students disproportionately benefited from the change in teaching techniques, teaching and learning techniques. Because basically, kids that came from pretty sophisticated families were pretty resilient to differences in teaching techniques. But kids that were first generation students or came from minority families did better when the class was taught better, basically, is what it comes down to. So that was an interesting finding. And I think, so when I was devising, along with my colleagues here, the strategic plan for the university and we got to the teaching part, the way that I phrased it is I want us to do evidence-based teaching and learning. Because there is a lot of evidence now that some of the things we're doing aren't working. So anyway, that, that's something that I hope that business people take to heart as they join boards. Yes? What are some of the, <clears throat> what are some of the techniques or processes you've been trying in terms of getting those differences uh, and understanding each other's uh, space, context they come from, to understand that and appreciate it? I mean, are you doing off-campus retreats or is there other things that you're finding that help the process? Yeah, I think we've done some of this. And, and so our board, as you may know, is a, a board responsible for four different institutions, including UNH. And uh, there are now off-campus retreats. And I think that uh, the board has been pretty receptive to hearing from especially the presidents of the universities about the realities that we face. I think people have come a long way. Uh, I don't really hear at our board meetings, you know, you just need to run this more like a business. I just don't hear that. I hear a lot more nuanced understanding about the challenges of running a university and the tricky balance between achieving your mission on the one hand and the university being financially viable on the other hand. And so this is, it sounds like kind of an obvious answer, but I think just more communication back and forth. And, and I think that the retreats, which we've done for at least the last couple of years, have been helpful for that. Because, and this goes back to a question I think, Marian, that you asked a while ago. What are you really going to do in a one-hour meeting or a 90-minute meeting? How much education is really going to go on there? Not much. And, and no board member wants to hear, 
me raise my hand and say, excuse me, I'm going to interrupt this board meeting for about a 20 minute lecture on the nature of governance at universities. That's a non-starter. So we have to find other ways to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Jim, can I take Harry's question one step further? What are you doing at this institution in terms of involving faculty in um, becoming more familiar with what you have discovered or has been discovered in terms of alternative ways of teaching. Mm. Um, because that has to be very threatening to people who have really focused for a long time on a particular approach and now be told, you know, that might not be the best. And an additional part of that is that we're not looking any longer at exclusively at what we all think of as, you know, a bachelor's, a master's, a doctorate, now increasingly people are wanting to be educated about a particular, meeting a particular need at which they might get a certificate or, mm. or some other acknowledgement um, that has nothing to do with four or six or ten years of school. All right. So on, on the first question, uh, which is how do we try and make faculty aware of the new forms of teaching and so on, uh, we're kind of picking our spots. Is it, that's a conversation I have with the provost, and it's the provost's responsibility to try and, and help make that work. And so uh, our provost is terrific. His name is Wayne Jones, lives here in the community. And what he has done is identify the so-called gateway courses in each discipline, Psych 101, Econ 101, and so on basically on the premise that, that those courses are serving the greatest number of students kind of by definition and working with them and using, I get lost in the acronyms, the Center for Teaching and Learning, I think is what it's called, um, and by invitation, uh, inviting them to take part in those. And we've got a number of programs like that and faculty have been actually surprisingly receptive to that. I mean, I, I don't think you come in saying, hey, what you're doing doesn't work. I, that's not a really great start. But I think if you say, you know, we've learned some new things about how students can learn best, and if you'd like to be part of this, we can help you adopt these new methods. And faculty, for the most part, have, have said yes to that. I, I usually will sort of kick off these sessions, and it's amazing. <laughs> Although I will say, when I did one of them this summer, and I said, well, thank you all for coming. This is really important. I can really see your dedication to students. At least one of them said, well, they told us we'd get an iPad if we came. <laughs> <laughs> so you used to just have to buy lunch for faculty. Now it, it's an iPad, right? We, we've bid it up. Um, this, the second question that, that you had was about so-called non-traditional um, markets. That's more on a volunteer basis at this point. It's still small enough with respect to the size of the university that we can afford to basically approach people as volunteers to do that. Whether it stays that way, I'm not so sure. Um, what will have to happen is that we'll have to figure out a way to, to measure the work, basically. You know, how do you count? Because, for example, a research active faculty member might teach two courses in the spring and two courses in the fall. And if you're now asking them to I don't know, drive to Manchester and teach a group for three hours on a Thursday night. You just have to figure out how to do it. And you know, one other complexity that you may be aware of that we deal with is that we have unionized faculty. So all of this gets negotiated. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us there. We don't have that one figured out yet. Yes, in the back, you've had your hand up for a while. Hi, yeah, I'm a faculty member in the English department. All right, so am I fired? How am I doing so far? <laughs> Sure. Uh, and one of them is um, the reverse. It's, it's fabulous that you're equating and um, acquainting the trustees larger for the business community with the academic practices. But I'm seeing almost uh, a reverse or open conversation. The, the, the colleagues that I know here and every place I've talked, I've talked in many places who've been educated, I've you know, flavors of degrees, the club sandwich approach to education, they're all over. We talk about teaching all the time. We know about this kind of research that you're talking about. We don't even need SEAL. SEAL is one of the, Thank you. the aspects, which is wonderful. But you know, so are our colleagues and our right. you know, weekly meetings. We discuss it informally, too, even when we're not officially talking about it. But we think a little bit too much.
much that we're have the bean count, and we have a kind of false notion, perhaps, of the business world. So when you talk about a different kind of classroom that's not the lecture, the, the stage right. on the stage, right. you know, women's studies knew about this in the 70s. Right. Uh, uh, Louise Rosenblatt, 1938, who wrote Literature and Declaration, these pedagogies had a 15-student writing class that was Albert Kisshaber back mm -hmm. at the beginning of the century, at the, 20, at the, oh, the past century. They knew this. Then there was pushback on the, both from faculty but also from the administration or the perceived administration, saying, no, you have to lecture, you have to treat, you have to have more students in every class. You have to put butts in seats. That's the expression they use. Butts in seats to get the tuition dollars. And it's the reverse of what we, particularly in certain disciplines like the humanities, mm -hmm. like literature, have long learned that lots of writing takes lots of time for faculty members to read it. In a typical semester, even in our research high institution where we now teach only two classes a semester often and not three, I read 4,000 pages of student writing. 4,000 pages of student writing passes before my eyes, and probably a book a week for each of my courses that I'm reading and talking about. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a lot of stuff. And so when you, if you have 30 kids in a class, that's about the absolute limit. You know? mm -hmm. And so that push, if this makes sense, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, sometimes it's they're too nervous about being thought ill of or not doing well by the university and the mm. trustees. So they overcompensate and they advocate, it seems like, a pedagogy, for example, or numbers of persons that is antithetical to the goals that you're talking about now, the best kind of education for the most diverse student body. Right. So that's really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, First of all, I'd know you were a professor because you provided the footnotes, you know, throughout your... That, that was really good. <laughs> Takes one to know one, right? I, I got that. Um, so I think what you've identified is a perfect example of how we might bring a business perspective and an academic perspective together to solve a problem. So how can we design classes that utilize what we know from research about the effectiveness of learning at the same time realizing that the university does not have unlimited resources. So, and, and I know you know, because you didn't just get here, that you can't run the university in the ground by having an inappropriate faculty-student ratio. On the other hand, if we're not educating these students the best way possible, we're not doing our jobs. So to me, those aren't competing perspectives, those are complementary perspectives. And I think it would be a fun activity to get people who have basically operations experience in the business world together with people who have you know, sweated blood over students like you have, said, what could we do? And I think there are ways to do it. And, and that's actually the very kind of thing that I'm hoping for as a result of the book. And, and I hope you never heard me say butts and seats, by the way. I think that was, that was some <laughs> other president. You don't say that. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, so to your point, and, and this is, is really of the moment in higher ed, um, my undergraduate degree was from Catholic University in Washington. And one day I read a book review. I think it might have been in the Wall Street Journal because they, well, no, they wouldn't have liked it. They would have written it, but they wouldn't have liked it. Um, this guy at Catholic University, a sociology professor, wrote a book called The Tyranny of Metrics, expressing the point of view of many, many academics across many universities. Yes, indeed. So I wrote to him. And I said, hey, I'm an alum of Catholic U. I'm writing this book about higher ed. Can we talk? And he said, no. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> he said no a little more elaborately than that, but it still sounded a lot like no. Right? You, know, you know a no when you hear one. So despite that, I have cited him in the book. And, and I you know, kind of want to tell the world how wrong he was. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a nuanced argument. He, he did make some points. Um, and that's actually another area where the two perspectives come together. Um, academics, professionals in any area, and academics in particular, believe that they should only be evaluated by one another using judgment. Some governments, you see this a lot in Europe, I don't know if you follow that or not, but they've got all these performance metrics and you get money based on the performance metrics. So it's not judgment and it's not by experts. And that's the trade space of the war that's going on about evaluating the performance of academics. So fun stuff. Okay. There's a chapter in there. Yeah. <laughs> what did you, yes. Uh, getting 
getting back to uh, Manchester, we used to have a higher level of integration of teaching in Manchester, and the University of Indiana bus got me to it. Mm. I used to travel on that bus quite a few years ago, mm. uh, doing a three-hour course in Manchester and so forth. And, uh, that resolved the issue of driving at night or driving in right. bad weather and things of that sort. That's, uh, I think, a worthwhile uh, investment. But I wanted to mention one thing that you did deal with somewhat in the book, but not as heavily as I might have hoped, but I knew you didn't have that kind of background, and that's the land-grant university. Mm -hmm. And that's, where, of course, where we are here. Right. And the land-grant university has certain public responsibilities that even go beyond what an average public university or college has. So if you write a sequel, I mm -hmm. hope you'll take a good look at the role of the land-grant to, to the people of the state. So that's a fair point. Um, I did talk about the land grants in the book uh, and talked about the wave of them that were formed in 1866 when this one was. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I don't think I said this, but I'm hoarse because I was at both the football and the hockey game on Saturday, and I, I did quite a bit of yelling, and I'm still paying for it. So I'm actually way better today than I was yesterday, but it, it was worth it. They were great victories. Um, so I did talk about it in the Morrill Act and the creation of the land-grant universities, and uh, then there was the second wave of them, 1890, something like that. And, but I, when I was writing it, I hadn't been here. And I didn't really know that much about land-grant universities. So you're right. I probably should have said more. I will say that now that I am here and I observe what we're doing to fulfill our land-grant status, it's, it's amazing. Um, I think in particular of cooperative extension, but it doesn't end there. But it starts there. Uh, we have a, a wonderful man, Ken LaValle, who's been leading that area for quite some time. And he's now been promoted to some broader responsibilities. Um, you would enjoy hearing that we've just done a survey across the university of projects that faculty and staff are doing in New Hampshire. And we got a tremendous response coming back. And we are doing, this is the Royal We we're doing work in every county and practically every city and town in New Hampshire dealing with education, with health care, with the environment. And we just met about it on Friday and are beginning to put together some communications to people in the state so that people will know what their flagship public land grant university is doing. Then the second part is, well, what else can we do? And you know, I, I will tell you that one of the uh, enigmas, maybe, is that while we are doing something everywhere, the vast majority of what we're doing is in the southeastern corner of the state, where we are. And I looked at the map, and I was a little bit horrified to see that until somebody pointed out that that's where most of the people live. <laughs> and so, you know, this, this is a non-trivial political issue, right, for, uh, for us is how, and you know, there is a university, you know, Plymouth State that's up there as you get into the North Country, and they have some specific responsibilities, and we've got, sorry, got Keene to the West. Um, but we probably do need to do more. Uh, in uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, at the invitation of a board member, I'm going to be in Whitefield, uh, New Hampshire, having dinner with 15 community leaders from Coas County and having them tell me what the situation is there and talking back and forth about what we might be able to accomplish as a university there. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been there a few times, mostly as a tourist, frankly. But I, I get the impression from talking with Scott Mason, who's the trustee in question, that there's some pretty deep uh, problems in, in the very northern part of the state. And that I would be naive to think that we're going to make major changes in a couple of months. On the other hand, I, I think we can try, see what we can do. And I, I think even the gesture of going up and, and spending an evening with the folks up there will probably be pretty well received. And I think that's in the spirit of your question, is it not? So we're, we're really trying to work on that. And um, when we make the report about the things we're doing around the state, that'll be made public, so it'll be easy for you to see. Maybe we can get Todd Selig to put it in the newsletter. <laughs> then everybody will read it. Thank you. Sure. I've been talking a long time, and you've been sitting a long time. So we can certainly wrap it up if you like. All right, well, thank you so much for, yes, one last question. Mm -hmm. Can you comment further on how that helps to foster your practice of educating? 
That's an interesting point. I, I hadn't thought of public-private partnerships as primarily uh, educational, although they probably are for both sides. Um, I think the, the private partner learns a lot about universities, and the university learns a lot about private business. And, and in fact, the case study in the book was effectively a public-private partnership, the, the bookstore. Um, we have been uh, enmeshed in a potential public-private partnership uh, here in Durham with the university for quite some time. And it's certainly been educational to me uh, about how challenging they are to try and, and get them to work. Um, but you, you make a good point. There are, there's definitely, there are definitely some overflow benefits in terms of education from these kind of partnerships. I do think the business people who work with us learn pretty quickly that it's not like working with some other business. And I think we learn pretty quickly it's not like working with another university. I mean, so. You know, the businesses will tell you, look, I need to have a 15 or 20% return on this. You know, can you guarantee that? No. <laughs> what else you got? Right. So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an interesting area. And I say that as somebody who grew up in business education, I've been a business school dean, it's still, you know, a bit of a stretch sometimes. All right. Well, thank you all so very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.